So again, what are the this question. three yeah, self-clocking formats? Three self-clocking formats. Are you talking about like the solar time? Apparent solar time? Negative. Three self-clocking formats. Okay, yeah. Think I'm about it. What's self-clocking? Okay, Marshman, you seem to be bipolar. Think about it. It's uh, RZ polar, RZ bipolar with uh, zero suppression and CDI. Good. Thomas, what makes CDI so much more different than the other signal formats? The uh, condition die phase, um, is it self clocking, right? Yes. What makes it different, though, than all the other signal formats? Um, I'm not sure. I thought it was just because it's uh, self-clocking. Oh, wait, is it? Oh, wait. I'm not sure. I, I, that's all I can think of. Okay, Senior Mabel, can you help him? Can you repeat the question, sir? Sure can. CDI, condition die phase, is so much different than all the other signal formats. Why? Wait, I think I have it. What? What makes it different? Think it, about it. It uses transitions, right? There you go. Transitions. Get that, Senior Mavell? Right, yes, so you guys kept cutting out, but I heard you. Okay, good. Might have to start doing this through. Can you see my chat, or can you see chat at all? Right, I can. Okay, so I might have to uh, put the questions in there from now on. Probably make it a little bit easier for you and uh, Quinos. All right, so we've gone over everything from one alpha through uh, one bravo. We're taking a look at the next question, which is Quiznos. What is a frame period or define frame period? Hopefully everybody can see chat. Okay, he's writing good. The amount of time it takes for one frame to occur between framing bits. Good. Mills. Yes, sir. Four types of bandwidth allocations. Four types of bandwidth allocations. Would that be conventional, demand assigned, dynamic, and time and day restriction? Yes. Stevens, tell me everything you need, everything you know about a balanced line. Balanced line. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Balance lines carry identical signals on two separate wires. Identical signals? And they're, they're 180 degrees out of phase? Yes. Those signals are identical until you flip one of them over 180 degrees. Whereas, what's the difference... Or tell me everything you know about a unbalanced line.
Oh, um, isn't that with one line? There's a return signal on it, correct? Um, and it's grounded? Mm-hmm. What happens on the center conductor? In the center? Like, on the line, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're asking? That is. Uh, there's a data signal. Okay. And an example would be? Well, it carries signals on one wire, and the other wire is grounded. Okay. What I'm asking for is an example of that scenario, as in a physical object. Oh, um, cable TV? Is, is, is okay, that, that is works. That it's cable. Coax cable. Coaxial? Yeah. Unbalanced, coaxial, balanced, twisted pair, two line. Yes. All right. So let's see here. Uh, Thomas. Wait a minute. Marshman. Tell me the three test modes of the HST 3000s. Sorry, can you read that again? Yeah, sure can. What are the three test modes of the HST 3000? Three test modes. Um, hard to think of off the top of the knob. Is it end to end testing? BR testing and. Sure, the last one. Monitor? I got it. Go ahead, Thomas. It was DT emulation, DC, and monitor. That is correct. Oh, boy. That's fine. Oh. Yeah, that, that cleared up there, Marshman? Yes, sir. Okay, Ooh. so let's. Uh, Bell? Still there? Yes, sir. All right. Let me write this in. DCE, what is it? Uh, data communication equipment. And what's it do? Would it be like everything between, like, say, the the uh, transmitting terminal uh, all the way up to the DTE. Okay. Can you give me an example? A device? Hold on. Quiznos, while he's doing that, yours is D. T-E, Delta Tango Echo. Yeah. Hey. If I'm being honest, yeah, I can't, I can't really think of an example offhand. Anybody? Of what the definition is? Or? Okay. DCE. Okay. Gosh darn it. It helps if I return it. Data communications equipment. An example would be. Modem. Modem. All right. So Quiznos has said for DTE, data terminal equipment. That's the end results of the source and destination, and it is the computer, as we like to call it. Okay. All right. I hope that kind of helps you out a little bit as to what we're getting at as far as the information is concerned. Just a quick review on what we have gone over in the past couple of days. So we're going to be looking at four charts, identify basic facts about the characteristics of the Tropo satellite support radio system. Disregard, that is the wrong one. Let's go with 
Bravo, identify basic facts about Tropo, because in order for us to operate with the Tisser, we got to go over the Tropo theory. Just remember 40, excuse me, having a bad day as far as thinking today. Remember you got 70% on the test, you can only miss 12, that means you got to get 28 correct. RF transmission application means that you're probably going to have to work with some type of line of sight equipment. In our case, Tropo is over the horizon. This is a new term that's been out for the last couple of years. This is an older version where they call it beyond line of sight. In a sense, it is true, but with Tropo, you're actually within the troposphere where beyond line of sight likes to use the ionosphere. We're going to look at tropo communications, antenna terms, and tropospheric antennas. So what is tropo? Well, they consider it beyond line of sight, but it's actually over the horizon. This is something that NASA and a couple of other scientific agencies have come up with to define between beyond line of sight and line of sight. It makes more sense to me. What does tropo do as far as tropo scatter? Well, what happens is, is tropo is the troposphere where everything that we live and breathe in, and when it gets into that convergence zone between the tropo and the stratosphere, there's a portion of that where troposphere can refract key word there, refract back down to Earth. It does not reflect. It refracts. So bending of the signal to come back. The rest of the information keeps going out into outer space. In other words, it keeps going and going and going just like the Energizer Bunny. So this is a diagram to give you an idea of how all this refracted energy gets back down. It's very, very small. The majority of the information that you transmit up into the troposphere keeps going. It's that very small part that the distant end is looking for, and that's where those highly specified high-gain antennas are going to be able to receive that and be able to pull the intelligence out. When we look at Tropo, we're looking at 300 to 50,000 watts, so let me try to give you an idea here. Power, when it comes to Tropo, normally it's in that 300 as far as tactical is concerned, because you don't want to create your yourself being a target. So you want to keep it low, which means that you're going to be going less farther than if you were a fixed one, which you could transmit at 50,000 watts. Technology has got better. The frequency range is about 350 megahertz to 8 gigahertz, depending on which scientific website did you go to, the range, if you're in a fix, depends again on what website did you go to, could be anywhere between 580 all the way up to 620. So why they chose 595, probably because that was the website that they looked at and they picked it. 150 miles, again, is around that figure and of course, you don't want to be transmitting out 50,000 watts if you're only doing 150 miles tactical. You just paint yourself as a big, huge target. Scattered volume is the same thing as common volume. All right, that's that little area right here. Let me grab that arrow here. That's this little arrow, area right here. That's what they're talking about. That's an area where it gets refracted back down to Earth. The big thing is about the antenna. Now, when we deal with the antenna, the bigger the dish, the better it is as far as gain. 
It doesn't mean it's a bigger antenna. It just means the gain is better on it. You can collect a lot more with it. When we look at Tropo, there are items that we discuss when we look at it, what's called a diversity system, and they compensate for blurring. Blurring being bleeding over from one side to the other. Let's take a look at each one of them. Polarization. Now, you are going to be doing something with a tisser where one site will be vertical polarization and then the other site will be horizontal. So let's say site one is vertical, site two is horizontal. Wait a minute. <coughs> Can you transmit and still be able to receive? The answer is yes. We go all the way down. Go ahead. Sorry, Sorry, sir. Would, would it just be like a very high decibel loss? Negative. If it's in separate polarizations, or would it still just be able to transmit no problem? Well, here's what I'm getting at. When we look at frequency, so polarization and frequency are directly related with this. Remember I told you, uh, I want to say yesterday, that when you are in a full duplex system with a repeater, you're going to receive one frequency and transmit another frequency. Right, so that they don't interfere. That's because when you have one side transmitting one polarization, it's going to receive it at that polarization, but retransmit it at a different polarization. So is the one you send out per se vertical and the one you receive is horizontal? Negative. Negative. And I'm going to explain okay. this here in just a minute. But what I'm trying to get at is when you are transmitting and you're pointing both dishes at each other, if one is vertical and the other one is horizontal, they're not going to interfere. It won't work. Copy, copy. I see what you're picking. Okay. I'm picking up what you're putting down. And why is that? Well, my response or the frequency to this is different. The transmit frequency on one site. You're, let's just say, and I'm just going to pick some frequencies. Let's say your site one, you're vertically polarized. Your transmit frequency, let's just say, is 300 megahertz. Your receive frequency is 400 megahertz. Well, since you're transmitting to the distant end, their frequency that they're going to receive is going to be a vertically polarized signal at 300 megahertz start to see the relationship. So you transmit from site 1 at 300, it gets received at 300 at the same polarization. When it retransmits, or I shouldn't say retransmit, when it's transmitting to from site 2 to site 1, that one is going to be transmitting at 400 megahertz and you're going to be receiving at 400 megahertz at a horizontal polarization. So that's how they keep from interfering with each other. It works kind of like a repeater system, except they're pointing at each other. And also remember this, they are transmitting and receiving at the same time. So when you go into your labs and you get the equipment, what I encourage you to do is put site one and site two together with their cut sheet and you'll notice a difference. Your transmit frequency will be their receive frequency. Their, their transmit on tri, uh, site two will be, their, will be your receive frequency. So and that's with full duplexes, right? Because if it was half duplex, it wouldn't matter because they wouldn't be able to both communicate at the same time. Right. You would have to have both the same antennas, as in w both would have to be vertical or both would have to be horizontal. For both half duplex and full duplex right, polarization, it doesn't matter. Uh, for half, okay, but half, half duplex, duplex doesn't matter. It, it's not going to matter whether you're, okay, you, if, you're, if you're half duplex, you've got to be on whatever the polarization is at the distant end is. So, you, you know, I'm talking mobile radios, they would be too vertical or too horizontal. Whereas, and I'm going to throw a really big curveball. When you guys are doing 
Well, let me ask you this. Who has already gone in and did their first lab with the tissers? None of us have done the tissers yet, okay. sir. All right. So when you go in there, look above me, and you will see that there is a very small dish. That's a one-foot dish with the small waveguide on it. Back behind there, on... Can everybody see that? Yes, sir. If I can... Nope, it's going to... Oh, now it's gone. gone. Yeah, I just got to do this to it. There we go. All right, so you see the dish. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor in here or not, but that dish is attached to something called an RF assembly. That RF assembly has an antenna in it. The scenario on that antenna is and I want you guys to think in block four. What was the polarization of the Nivis near vertical incident sky wave? Anybody remember? Was it vertical? And? Oh, and also horizontal. It was uh, yeah. okay. omnidirectional. It, it was because of the way the lobes work. The whole antenna becomes omnidirectional, but it's also a sky wave antenna, too. Hear me out. Are the antenna elements straight up and down, or horizontal when you put it up? Whenever you put it up, it is bidirectional, right? It's straight up and down whenever you put it up. <laughs> wait, wait a second, wait. The Nivis. Yes, Nivis. Nivis. The Nivis. Wait, was the Nivis the circular polarization? No. No, that's the, that's the uh, 2011. The Nivis, that was, uh, it came in each, like, little part. Yeah, each it little had, three foot uh, I think, piece. eight mass sections that rose about yes, 15 sir. feet, and then you had four elements that you put at 90 degrees element, or 90 degrees apart from each other. That makes sense? Well, well, so it was horizontal. It was horizontal. It wasn't vertical. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Isn't it negative. circular polarization? Negative. You're thinking of the AV2011. Okay, hear me out, guys. The Nivis, the center pole, when you run those antenna elements close to the ground and then they have the little uh, stakes that you can push into the ground, those elements come up a certain distance above the ground. Those lines, those wires, are the antenna. And you notice that every one of them is at a 45-degree angle or close to it. That 45-degree angle gives you a vertical polarization close to the ground, and as you get closer to the top of the mass, gives you a horizontal polarization. So you have a mixture of both. With the above me, that particular antenna, if you get ready to put in the waveguide, the waveguide is goes into the center of the antenna, you will notice that there is a 45-degree hole in there, and that's so it doesn't matter what uh, polarization your transmit is from the distant end, it's going to receive either horizontal or vertical. And that's where the frequency and polarization comes into play. Those two items. Now, hear me out. You're going to have to, when you guys get to the tisser, 
you should be able to take a look at that waveguide when you get ready to put it in there you're going to notice that hole is 45 degrees now that 45 degrees is the receive portion when you're coming from the distant end it doesn't care what polarization it is so the blurring is that little area there angle and space angle is where you point the antenna up down, left, right, just like the AV2011. You got azimuthal, and then you got elevation. The idea is you need to get it into that scatter volume area to receive it and to transmit it. The space between the two dishes. If you're inside Jones Hall pointing the dish at each other, it ain't going to matter. You can vary that dish anywhere. In fact, as an experiment, I had the students point their dishes 180 degrees out of where they needed to point them. Guess what happened? They were still receding. Still and working. Working. Yeah, because they were so close together. Outside, almost the same thing. When I say almost, is you know everything was bouncing off everywhere. But the further away that you get, the more the angle and azimuthal that you're needed in there. So angle and space are directly related to. So with tropo scatter, you have polarization and frequency are related in that part, and then angle and space. You're going to see it when you get in there. And again, it's showing you more of a common volume and the scatter angle and the difference between their transmitting antenna and receiving antenna. The P2P has a max, I think the P2P 700, the last time I looked at the specs, far exceeds the TISSER when you are looking at distance because I think it's like 123 miles, 125 miles. And of course, you know, you, you still have that scatter angle in that area. Common volume. So scatter basically just means how it spread. That is correct. How it refracts off of the troposphere. Now these are two common things that we have already covered in block four. Reciprocity is basically using the same antenna for transmit and receive because it transmits well and receives well. Directivity and gain pretty much are a good relationship. The higher the directivity, the higher the gain. Lower directivity, the lower the gain. In other words, the bigger the dish, the better the gain. The smaller the dish, the smaller the gain. Yeah, it is correct. The more gain, the further it can go. Correct. Well... Yes and no. It depends on what the wattage is and the frequency. Now, frequency is proportional, inversely proportional to the size of the antenna. So we're dealing with a tisser that has between 14.4 gigahertz and 15.25 gigahertz. And when you guys did the wavelength, factoring in block four, you found out that the lower the frequency, the bigger the antenna, higher the frequency, the smaller the antenna. If you get one of the testers that has the little plastic piece taken off of it, you will see a very small antenna in the back, and that's at, in that 45 degree angle area where you're putting the waveguide on. There is two different types of antennas that we look at when we are talking about line of sight. They are the horn antenna and parabolic. We've covered both of those in block four, but we're going to go just a little bit deeper. The horn antenna pretty much says the same thing that you saw in block four. Simplest type directs RF energy to the desired location. And then, you, of course, you have impedance matching. Parabolic antenna, just like DirecTV and Dish Network, but when you came into Jones Hall off to the left-hand side as you were walking around the fenced-in area, 
There's your satellite system. You have front feed and rear feed. The front feed is often center fed or offset. With the rear feed, it's pretty much two different types called Cassegrainian and Cutler. On the Tisser, it's considered a Cutler. This is your front feed, and this is your offset. So front feed center fed, front feed offset. That look familiar when you're walking by the uh, fenced in area? Look at this in Outside of Jones Hall? Yep, outside of Jones Hall. Oh, yeah, it looks really familiar. Yep. You can't miss that one. That's one of the bigger ones there. Cassegrainian has something called a parabolic sub, excuse me, hyperbolic. Yeah, it's a parabolic sub reflector. They call it a hyperbolic, but it's a parabolic. It is basically there to reflect the energy back into the waveguide. When you compare the Cutler to the Cassegrainian, the difference is that parabolic sub reflector. This one has a concave reflector versus two tabs that are about a 45 degree angle on the, uh, the Cutler one. So they work differently, but are both what I call double shots. Bigger the antenna, better the gain. Here is the Cutler. It says classifies it as a double shot, but both of them are really a double shot. Why? Because if you take a look at this, what does the transmit path do? Well, the feed horn sends it out to the parabolic subreflector. It reflects it back onto the dish and the dish focuses the energy out whereas this one does the same thing the double shot it, it's going to bounce off of the dish into where the two metal tabs are and feed it down into the waveguide back to the antenna and vice versa for transmit they consider this one though a narrow beam compared to the Cassegrainian. So there you have it. Tropospheric communications, antenna terms, and tropospheric antennas. Any question? Questions, questions. None for me, sir. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through this next one, which is for Charlie. We're only going to go through part of it. Probably about the first five or six slides. Identify basic facts about the characteristics of the Tropo Satellite Support Radio. This is better known as a Jerk 239. You have the tech order for this. And we will be going over the tech order after we get through the C's and D's. Highly recommend that you have the C's and D's out when we are following them tomorrow. Again, you got the 70% that you got to pass in order to go on to the next block. You guys are probably going to be the last couple classes to go through the 239. There's very few out in the Air Force. They're starting to, I think there's three organizations that have it now. Why? Because, are they outdated? Well, they're considered outdated, but... You know, you never can tell when your time comes up to where they're going to set up a base. They're still used, but they still are being broke out, taken a look at, making sure they work, and then put them back into the case until they're needed. My guess is after this year, they will no longer be in the Air Force inventory. That's the reason why we're going to the P2P 700. P2P meaning point to point. Just like the Jerk 239, again, it has met its life cycle. Now, why has it met its life cycle? Because some of the parts we can't get anymore. That's the reason why it's at the end of the life cycle. And that's the reason why the Air Force is scrambling to get these P2Ps in place. We're going to look at purpose of the Jerk 239, the operating characteristics, types of traffic, equipment, and we're going to stop right there before we get into signal flow. Let's look at the purpose. 
Now, all of this can be found in the tech order. This is a full duplex linocyte terminal. Lightweight, field tunable. I don't know about the lightweight because it's three cases and you need two people to manhandle those. It is designed for quick deployments. Well, that's pretty true. Easy to transport determines on what you're transporting it with. It, there is short setup and teardown times because it is very quick to set up and tear down. Uh, it is very good in adverse conditions. Now, give you a backstory on it. We used to have something called RF mods, which were better in technology, but really crappy to pin on. They were commercial off-the-shelf items and every time that you pulled one down set it up you would have problems. With this one you don't have any problems other than now they're the thumb wheels are broken and we can't get them anymore but they are still usable. Operating characteristics the frequency range is 14.4 to 15.25 the P2P, I think, is from 2 to 5 gigahertz. So there's pretty much, it's pretty close. The power on it is 25 dBm, 300 milliwatts. The IF frequency is 70 megahertz. Wow, where have you heard that one? Maximum range, you'll see that there is a less than sign in front of the 25 miles. There's a reason. It uses the metric system because it is a UK product. Condition die phase and pseudo NRZ are the types of traffic. Notice I said types of traffic. I did not name our order wire. Order wire is our side of the house. Is it possible to use order wire and not the mission traffic? Yes. Yes. Mission traffic is considered the condition die phase and pseudo NRZ. Order wire is put on there in the modulation process. We'll get to that tomorrow. There are two sub assemblies or two assemblies. Above me, you can pretty much tell that they're separate. The RF assembly, which is where the dish is and then next to it is the baseband assembly. With these assemblies the baseband can be pulled off of the tripod and put into a rack. It can sit on a table. It can be put on a tripod or just any surface that's flat. With the RF assembly there are three places it can be put. You can put it on the <clears throat> CTM-15 or you can put it on a tripod or you can put it on a pole. Putting it on the tripod is the easy part. Putting it on a pole takes a lot of uh, coordination in order for you to get it up to the pole. Normally it requires a cherry picker to do that. And then you have a 50 foot mass. Now the CTM 15 if you were to take a look at the, I'm trying to think of it, the cases, and if you looked at block four, you will notice that on the front section of those tubes, some of them have the CTM 15, and some of them have the Jerk 239 on them. Hmm. In one of those cases, do come with all the cables, guy ropes with it, as well as the stakes. The difference is, is we have a foot and a half stakes in block four. In block seven, they come with two foot stakes. Big difference. On the 50 foot mass, you can only put the one foot dish on there because it comes with a one foot and a two foot dish. If you put the two foot dish and put it on the mast, you're going to break the mast. Why? Because it's nothing more than a big sail. This is what a baseband assembly looks like. You can see that we have, this is our power supply as well as our breaker panel. This is our order wire 
receiver section. This is also a transmitter section. And this is our order wire section. Sorry about confusing you with the order wire because I saw this little part right here. It says order wire receiver and order wire transmitter. These are all indicator lights to let you know what's going on inside the baseband assembly. You'll notice that there are four sub-assemblies here for what we call line replaceable units. You notice that we have a breaker panel and a power supply. Both of those are located in this assembly. Actually, the power supply is along the side here, but the breaker panel is right here. When you open them up, you can see we have four screws here and here. It slides out, and you should be able to get access to either one. Again, baseband unit has five LRUs, line replaceable ah. units. With the RF unit, this one is three line replaceable units. All of them are behind that panel that's on a hinge. You can use it with a one or two foot antenna. You can either have a two foot cable, which is what is normally used on the tripod, and then you have the 150 foot if you want to put it on the CTM15 or locate, let's say, the baseband unit inside a nice, comfortable air conditioned tent where you can put the RF assembly outside. Just remember the transmit and receive frequencies need to be between 200 megahertz apart, if not more. And it has everything to do with how much bandwidth it takes up. For example, if you're at 15 gigahertz, your upper end frequency is probably around 15.1 and your lower side would be about 14.9. That's 200 megahertz apart. That's the reason why. So the RF has three and the other one has five, right? That is correct. And it's all within the tech order. You can read it in, geez, chapter one all over the place and in chapter two of your tech order. And this one's called RF. What's the other one called? Baseband. Gotcha. Baseband 5, RF 3. Yeah. It's pretty easy to identify. All the frequencies that have it in the, in the antenna and the dish, that's your RF assembly. The other one, it's, it's just being connected to the RF assembly is your baseband. Two antennas, well, actually two dishes and two different waveguides. You have a one foot and a small waveguide and a two foot and a larger waveguide with a two foot size dish. We'll go over that tomorrow. This is the one foot dish coming straight out of the tech order. It has 31 dB of gain, mounts on a tripod, pole, or mast. Two foot antennas, 37 dB of gain, and mounts on a tripod or pole only. Here is the signal flow. Just remember pages four, five, six, and seven, we will be going over for both the transmit path, the receive path, the standby loop back, and order wire. Questions? Because I'm going to end it there. It's pretty short, but still a good amount of information for us to retain for the day. That is correct. That's the reason why I don't go into the Schematics, all right, well, not really schematics, the block diagrams on them because nowadays we don't even, it does show some things that I relate to as far as getting down into the basic electronics. It's getting to that point where everything becomes, you know, the radio becomes remove and replace. But you still have to know what goes on inside of it to determine if it's the cable or the antenna or something else that's happened along the way. Sir, so, may you tell me what's an order wire again? Order wire is our, as in maintenance's, channel. Okay? Think of it this way. AT&T has a separate number for all their technicians. That way they can call directly into their troubleshooting place. 
we as customers, what do we got to do? Uh, we got to listen to robot girl or guy. Then we got to go, okay, when you finally are able to get through all of the troubleshooting measures that they have, they may connect you with the person that can do the troubleshooting with. So that's going through all that mission traffic just to get to somebody that you know you can get to whereas the technicians have a direct link right to them so mission traffic is the multiplexer stuff ours is a separate channel from that multiplexer traffic even though it's modulated onto the same frequency we have our own channel it is solely a, with us because if something goes wrong we have to talk to each other on the dis and in and if you didn't have the channel then we got problems with the, the equipment we don't have to have the multiplexers mission traffic in order for us to talk back and forth but it helps you know, trying to troubleshoot equipment. Hey, my equipment on my end's good, and you tell the dis and in, hey, your equipment, you want to take a look at it? This is the scenario. Without even having to, you know, everybody's going, well, I'll just pull out my cell phone. Well, what happens if you're in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone coverage? So that's our little channel, communicate back and forth without worrying about mission traffic. Kind of like the HST 3000. The bit error rate test set. So order wire, our channel, maintenance. Mission traffic, that's the main traffic for everybody. That kind of clear it up for you? Yes, sir. So order wire is just for us, basically. Mm -hmm. We have to do troubleshooting. We also have to set it up. So what better way of doing it with our own separate channel? Understandable, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, uh, for today, all right, we have homework to do. You have all of 4 Bravo and start on 4 Charlie. We are not going to go over 4 Bravo's homework tomorrow. We will be going over 4 Bravo, 4 Charlie, and 5 Alpha come Monday. And bring your. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, so, how far into uh, four Charlie should we be looking into? I mean, four uh, Bravo was it? Four Bravo. Let me pull up my handy dandy. You guys looking at my answers? <laughs> All right, so for Charlie, you should be able to do all the way up to number four for today. Number four. Yep, number four. Number four, all of her, four problem. Yep. Now, with that in mind, you guys should be starting to work on your appraisals. Because we'll yes, be, sir. Okay, so I'm just letting you know they do go through the objectives. I'm not going to go over the appraisals until, I think, Tuesday. When is your test? Wednesday? Wednesday. Okay, so that's about right. So Monday is... Covering the homework and that appraisals. Well, actually, appraisals would be due on Monday. Review on Tuesday so you can do the test on Wednesday. I'll put it all in chat after we get done so no one is confused. All right? Any questions? Again, SIA tomorrow morning between 10 and 11. I'm normally on before that. I'll pop in between 10 and 10.15 if no one's there or no one comes in. 
I'll pop back off, but that does not mean I'm not there. Class tomorrow at 12.30 to go over objectives, the rest of 4 Charlie and all of 5 Alpha. Tomorrow's Thursday, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. And then uh, we'll go from there. 12 o'clock, 12, not 12 o'clock, 12.30. I'll put everything in chat so I don't confuse you. All right? Yes, sir. Sounds, Sounds good. good sir. All right. We shall see you tomorrow. Be there, be square, and have a nice night. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Have a good day.